you're just joining the call, folks, if you're just joining the call, please uh, mute yourself. And uh, but when it's time, you can you can of course in, interject, unmute if you need to interject a question. Um, just because there are so many of us on the call today, I want to make sure there's no accidental uh, noise. Beta, ye, beta, mute kar beta. Thanks. And also, Raja and Alili, you can mute people as well. Yeah, we might do that. You might just go around and mute yes. everyone. Uh, yeah. I think everyone's muted at this point. Okay. Um, Perfect. So let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. It's February 21, 2024. This is our third information session for 2024. Some quick housekeeping. Um, this call is being recorded. Please mute your microphone, but feel free to micro uh, unmute if you have any questions. We're going to do some brief intros, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Overall, this session today will cover what is the SIP program, the intern application, timelines, what to expect for 2024, and then the best part, the Q&A session. Um, so I'll introduce myself first. My name is Anand Lalaria, and I'm the SIP operations coordinator. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily Espinosa. I'm the SIP assistant director. And my name is Raja Gohatakurta. I founded the SIP program in 2009, and I now serve as the faculty director of something called CREST, uh, which is an umbrella that um, SIP is under. And I wanted to introduce Lindsay. Lindsay, if you have a moment. Hi, everyone. Lindsay, yes, I just joined a little bit late. Um, sorry about that. I'm Lindsay Lauber. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the CREST Associate Director. As Raja said, um, CREST is the umbrella organization under which SIP now sits. Um, and we have a few programs under our umbrella, and um, we engage students in the public in critical thinking in the context of STEAM research. Thanks for being here. Yes, we've got 90 participants on this call. It is lunchtime if you're on the Pacific time zone, so quite an audience. Before we get started, um, we will play a fun intro video to get an uh, inside look on what SIP is like. This was a visual story that captured a SIP 2023 project. And let me know if you can hear it and the audio works. And also, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them to the general chat instead of direct messages just so um, others who may know the answer can also uh, respond to your questions. Yeah, the audio is coming through great, Anna. Perfect. In May, I traveled to Corsica, France, where I began research on my first two chapters in my dissertation, which was on the social behavior of the oscillated wrasse and related species. Coming back from the field, I had hours worth of data to analyze, and so I signed up for the SIP program in order to get assistance in analyzing this data. The Science Internship Program, or SIP, is a 10-week program where motivated high school students come in and they participate in real research projects. So the mentors are undergraduates, graduates, or faculty at UC Santa Cruz who need help on a real research project. And these interns help out and in return get research skills and learn a lot about the process of research um, at a university level. So you can see in the background, when we look at the wide views, we'll see like that satellite chasing people in the back. But I would probably code that right now as a chase, which I think is H. Starting in June, I began to participate in SIP and taught my students the tools necessary to analyze my data. They were able to work through my behavioral footage way faster than I expected. And I'm coming off here at the end of the summer with more than half of my data analyzed and a pretty good idea of where my conclusions are going to lead me. And so every, pretty much every animal in the sea loves eggs. They're like a great source of food. All right. And so they will eat eggs. My interns served as primarily research assistants over the summer. I first taught them the behavioral editing program, Boris, that allowed them to score behaviors. It was really great to work with my mentor, Megan, in coding. I learned programming languages, which is unbelievable for me at the beginning. And now I'm available and capable of knowing the fish species and observing and interpreting their behaviors. 
This program is important because I get to gain experience in research and create new connections with people in the field and people who will be in the field. What I liked about collaborating with my mentor is uh, hearing new, her stories, getting new experience through instruction and just learning about her job in the field. When my daughter entered the SIP program, she met so many graduate and postdoctoral students who were so much in love with their work. Today, she's doing exactly what she did at the SIP program. She is a marine scientist as well as an engineer working on climate adaptation and diseases. So most people don't get a research experience like this until they reach a college level. And I think SIP does a huge benefit by giving these interns an early view of what research is like because they get to understand the day-to-day -day experience and they get to understand what fields and opportunities are out there. I want to try being a researcher or a marine biologist when I grow up. SIP is a great opportunity to just try new things. SIP offers young people life and career skills in a short span of 10 immersive weeks to gain skills that they can be fairly confident of and most importantly that they will add to the growing body of really meaningful knowledge in science. That is a great question. Right off the bat, um, can SIP be done remotely? So, SIP 2024, what is SIP 2024? SIP 2024 will be a nine week program, two weeks of online research preparation, and then seven weeks of in person active research that students will participate in on UCSC campus. Um, students will be working with UCSC PhD. Interns will be working with PhD students, professors, and post-PhD researchers, and they will provide one-on-one -on -one mentoring of these high school interns. Um, the best part about SIP is the projects, the, re the research projects that interns will work on are real, and they are not just made up for high school students. Student interns are being inserted into existing research projects currently happening at UCSC. And there are opportunities for wider exposure to topics in current research academic enrichment and college preparation that are embedded into the program during the in internship day. All right, so the categories of STEAM activities, SIP encompasses three out of the four that are shown. Um, uh, SIP interns will have access and enrichment and exposure. They will work and improve their research skills, they will be building these. And ultimately, this is all through the lens of open-ended research projects. The essence of SIP is critical thinking in the context of closely mentored, open-ended, real-world research projects. And this is a former SIP intern. This is a fun chart looking at the growth over the 15 years of SIP. Um, this is year 16. We had a lot of growth during the virtual years, going from 180 students when we were last fully in person, to 225, 313, 326, and 394 in last year's hybrid version of SIP. This year, we'll see how many students we have. We encourage everyone to apply. It's looking like we'll have a solid number, but the main a distinguishing factor about SIP 2024 will be that it will be a SIP in-person program for SIP interns. All right, this slide is looking at the gender and diversity of the program. Roughly a third of all SIP interns have overcome serious societal, societal obstacles coming from underrepresented ethnicities, being first-generation college aspirants, and coming from low-income backgrounds. Um, this is a view of the three to two female to male uh, gender ratio of our SIP interns. Wow, I just have to stop right there. 
I think I see Shalom Yifru answering some questions in the chat. Shalom, can you unmute and give yourself give yourself a fun little intro to our audience? Hi everyone, my name is Shalom. I'm a second year uh, computer science student at UCSC. Um, I'm also the SIP PA, so I'll be here to answer questions in the chat if you guys you know need any help or Thank anything you, like that. Yeah, I'll be here yeah, in the background. Shalom. A Shalom, PA is a, is a program PA? assistant. Yes, exactly. Uh, I just sorry, sorry. I just jumped in. Shalom is one of two program assistants we have right now yeah. and here. We will have three over the summer, but Shalom is there on the ground during the day and at night. She's a quasi RA as well, but she's a vital member of the SIP team. Glad to have you here. Let's make you a co host real quick. Okay. So some statistics over the 15 years of SIP, 485 high schools have been represented. Um, this would be 2,225 high school participants. Um, 1875 of these are different high school participants, different high school students, and there have been 350 in instances of repeats. SIP alumni coming back for additional years of SIP. This is a fun view of the 493 different high schools that have been represented in SIP. And Raja, feel free to jump in here. I know this text is very small, but black, the black text is it for is California schools, schools that are in California. Yes. Blue, Blue is text, out of state. Out of state. And red is international. International. And then italics is um, private schools and Roman font is uh, public schools. There are many more public schools in the program than have been private schools. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a look at the SIP research projects. Um, a research project consists of one to two mentors, either a primary mentor or a primary mentor and a co-mentor. These are PhD students, post-PhD PhD researchers and professors. Um, projects consist of a minimum of three, but they can have more high school students. Um, there, it's looking like one of our projects this year will have 15 interns. So that's going to be a super fun and exciting collaborative project with a, with a really um, experienced SIP mentor. And then there is the eligibility guidelines. The, basically the essential one is interns must be 14 years of age or older. And this is from the start of the program. So you must be 14 by June 24th, 2024. And you, the eligibility is from 14 to 17. So you, you should be 17. You're, you can't essentially turn 18 by the end of the program. There's a better way of saying this, but. I put this in 14. detail in the chat. Um, we did? I put this in, in great detail in the chat. So okay, 2024 perfect. interns must turn 14 before yeah. June 24, 2024, and must turn 18 after yeah. August 10, 2024. Yeah. That's the, those are the criteria, very simple. That's well said. And essentially this usually uh, comes back to rising freshmen to rising seniors. Okay, SIP spans 25 different subject areas at UCSC. So there's a wide variety of um, options to choose from, essentially a little bit of everything that you can be interested in. Um, this is an example of a sample project. Um, this is what you'll find on the research projects page on the SIP website. Um, just for, I just had to read this page, you'll see the project code. This is CSC01. This is a computer science and computer engineering project. The title is here. Who is the primary mentor? Who is the faculty advisor? The location, this was during a remote online year, and the number of interns. There were four interns in this project. This is an overview of the project, the project description. This is an overview of the tasks, what SIP interns will learn and do, and then required skills for interns prior to acceptance and skills interns will hone and acquire. Um, this is an example of an astronomy and astrophysics sample project. And a Really good source would to be to, if you go to the SIP 2024 page, we will be adding some projects soon and this page will be updated um, as we receive more projects. But a really good resource would you be look 
would to be would be to look at previous years, so recent research projects. If you look at the 2023 page, you can see what we had for computer science. So we had a large variety, and this would be a great way to get a sense of what we'll be able to offer this um, year and just how to prepare that. Here is the shot. Here's the link. Okay. So some more program details. What to expect in 2024? Keep hitting this nail on the head, but it will be a fully in-person program. We're super excited to welcome our interns back on campus to engage directly with our community resources and opportunities at UC Santa Cruz. Um, from everything we learned last year, working with our interns, working with our mentors, learning and talking with them, um, just a fully immersive in-person experience just helps immensely with fostering deeper connections, hands-on learning, and, over and, and enhancing the overall educational journey, journey for our interns. Um, the program, runs Monday through Friday, and research takes place from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, the specifics, your day-to-day, -day, your schedule will vary by research project, but this is a brief, or this is a broad overview of the time you should dedicate and um, have set aside for SIP. So interns should expect to dedicate roughly six hours per day to their internship. Um, interns are expected to be self-starters, i.e. comfortable working independently without their mentor. Interns must prioritize their SIP research and be careful to minimize all other summer commitments. Attendance is crucial. Interns are required to engage in the full duration of the program. Interns who repeatedly fail to engage will be dismissed from the program. That is the academic research side of the research day. There are extracurricular offerings that take place throughout the week after 4 p.m. Beyond the research that forms the course of 2024, we will offer a variety of academic enrichment lectures, research career prep workshops, and social activities designed to enrich the intern's summer experience and foster community among interns. All activities will be conducted in person, allowing interns to benefit from direct interaction and networking with professionals, educators, and peers. So let's get into the program cost for SIP 2024. There is an application fee. When you submit your application, this is a $60 fee that comes into place at the end. If you are given an offer, there is a $500 deposit to hold your spot. And then there will be some more time and the remainder of the academic program fee is $4,250. So the tuition is $4,750 for the summer program. The best part, there is financial assistance. Full and partial need-based scholarships are available. Um, everyone has the opportunity to apply for financial aid within the general SIP application. The application portal opens on March 1st, 2024, and it runs through the entire month of March, with the deadline being on Sunday, March 31st, 2024, at 11.59 p.m. Pacific time. So there are four parts. And within part one, there's an option to unlock the fifth part, which is the financial aid application segment of the application. So part one is personal information. Part two is research that uh, you will, um, where you input. Part two is for teacher recommendations. You will select one teacher for one letter recommendation. This can be anyone. It doesn't have to be necessarily a STEAM teacher. Uh, we recommend that the teacher that will write you the strongest letter of recommendation is the one that you choose and that you choose to get a recommendation for. And then you will also upload your most recent unofficial transcript or grade report. Part three, this is the fun part. This is for us. We, this is, we will have three essays in this segment. Um, there are two short essays, 250 words or less. This is where you write about your two top subject areas that you would like to research and that and your interests that you would like to research during the summer. And then there's a longer, there was a slightly longer short essay. This is 450 words or less. And this is more of a personal statement and an essay about what you would like to get out of your SIP 2024 research internship experience. Part four is certification and submission, just acknowledging all the information you um, have written down and are submitting is yours and 
just double checking everything. And then part five is the financial aid application. In the financial aid application, we ask for your most recent tax forms and the number of household dependents um, that you have in your family. All right. This is the program schedule for 2024. Again, the month of March, the application is open. After the deadline on April 26th, the first round of admission offers will be sent out. May 7th is the deadline to accept admi the admission offer and pay your deposit. And then we have given another week and May 15th is the final deadline for full payment and submitting your registration packet. Um, the program starts and the first two weeks from June 10th to, 20, to June 21 will be the research preparation weeks. These will be online. The schedules will vary. Week one, this is not gonna be the nine to four uh, schedule that is in place when active research takes place. But during week one of research preparation week, uh, we have a variety of research. We will offer some PR, Python and research tutorials for all students to um, take part in and learn about Python research. And we will offer an intro to research uh, lecture to just prepare yourself. And usually during week two of research prep, and this can happen in week one as well, but the mentors will reach out to the interns. They will meet over Zoom. Interns will meet with their fellow interns. The Discord will start. Interns will start interacting and learning and prepping with their other fellow interns. And there will be more sessions and meetings throughout that week. Sunday, June 23rd, this is the SIP 2024 program kickoff day. This was this will be also this is also move-in day, um, but this will take place on campus and it will be around noon. Um, June 24th through August 9th. So that is the Monday following program kickoff. This is the start of the seven weeks of active in-person research. And then Saturday, August 10th, this is the SIP final presentation day. Attending presentation day is expected, even if interns can't attend the final weeks of SIP due to an early school start. So this is just to answer a lot of questions. If school does start before August 10th or August 9th, and, um, and just let your mentor know, let the SIP staff know, and we will work with you to adjust your schedule so you can fully participate at the beginning of your school year and finish up your SIP work. All right, so let's talk about getting to SIP. There are a bunch of options. There are two shuttles that we offer. There is a North Silicon Valley shuttle. There are two stops, the Mountain View Caltrain Station and Saratoga High School. There are two options for this shuttle, either a daily weekday all summer long shuttle option. So that essentially that's Monday through Friday, every single day in the morning and every single, the bus uh, picks up students in the mornings and will drop them off in the afternoons. And then there is the Monday morning and Friday afternoon shuttle service. So if you are going to be in the dorms for five days instead of the seven days, you will bring your stuff. The bus will pick you up, take you to SIP, take you to campus, and you'll be able to be in the dorms, and then you'll be able to return on Friday afternoons. The South Salinas Watsonville shuttle, this serves students from the Gonzalez Salinas Watsonville schools and areas and districts. This is a once a week, Monday a.m. and Friday p.m. Uh, shuttle service. Um, you can get dropped off either by personal car or carpool. Um, we ask interns not to drive during the research hours of the day. And then for Santa Cruz residents, the public bus works really well. And then this will be more in depth and this will be um, in the registration packet, but weekly shuttle signups, um, we do have a deadline. It is by Wednesday at 12 noon of the previous week. So this is just more information, um, an in-depth look at the transportation North Shuttle options. So just pick up times, drop off times, sign up. We can do this on a week by week basis. Um, the cost is $200 for the daily weekday shuttle. And then the cost is $65 for a Monday morning and Friday afternoon, the shuttle service. And these are the addresses. This is an in-depth look on the South Shuttle. Again, the pickup times, the drop off times, and locations. Um, a little bit about SIP dorm and housing. So 
The cost of housing and meals, room and board, this is $600 a week for the five-day weekday housing plan, Sunday dinner through Friday lunch, and it is $875 for the full week, seven-day housing plan, uh, and this includes all meals. Um, this is a guide on what's in the room and what to bring, and we will work with you um, when you get accepted, whether you are coming domestically from locally or out of state or international, but what is in a room? Every room and rooms will consist of either doubles or triples, um, two to three interns. Um, a room comes with an extra long twin bed and mattress, a desk, a chair, bookshelf, clothing, storage. This can be a closet, dresser, a wardrobe unit, and your trash and recycling cans. We ask interns to bring bedding, uh, laundry items, hangers, emergency uh, materials, equipment, an alarm clock, bath, bathrobe, decorations, desk lamp, earplugs, headphones, and some other stuff. We'll work on, with you to get you ready for moving. This is, um, these are the Crown Colleges. This is the Crown College. SIP was in, what well, SIP was based out of the Crown College back in 2018, I believe. Um, last year, SIP 2023, um, the interns were housed in the John R. Lewis, formerly known as College 10 House. This year, the SIP dorms will be housed, uh, the SIP interns will be housed at College 9. So right next to College 10. Um, there are a bunch of recreational activities for interns. We are excited for this upcoming slate and the scheduling that will all be posted um, before SIP starts. Um, field trips and activities in the past have been a field trip to Google beach days, boardwalk days, and this is a trip to an observatory. Daily life, dining hall. There is your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, we will be in the College 9 and 10, or College 9 and John R. Lewis dining hall. Um, there is something for everyone. There's a wide variety of vegan, gluten-free uh, options, and um, the menu is different every single day, and the food is prepared fresh. Questions, Q and A. Let's get into it. Uh, hold on. Do we just unmute and ask questions? One hundred percent. Or if you put up your hand and then we'll call. Oh, on you. Okay. But yeah. Um, can I jump the gun there? there? I'm sorry. What? No I saw this thing mentioned a lot on a lot of the programs for last year called yeah. MATLAB. What is MATLAB? Is that something offered by UCSC or is that like an outside program? What What am I looking at there? Say that again, MATLAB, M-A-T. M-A-T-L-A-B. Um, it was all caps, I believe. Yeah. yeah. So MATLAB, of course, is, um, um, you know, is a package, software package that's used to do mathematical calculations, make, uh, do visualizations, et cetera. Uh, it's, you know, it's a commercial thing. It's got nothing to do with UC Santa Cruz. It's something that researchers all over the world use. I, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to. I, I think it is. It had if some... I can add to that, so all SIP interns do receive a UCSC email for the summer, and that gives you access to certain programs that UCSC has partnerships and licenses with. And I do believe MATLAB is included in that. So if your project requires MATLAB and use of MATLAB, you would be able to use it through your UCSC summer okay. account. Summer um, I have one more question, then I'll, I'll stop talking. 100%. Are we allowed to suggest research projects, or is that like something handled by the SIP mentors? I can take that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. The research projects are the, uh, the design of the research projects is very much um, the domain of our mentors, and you know most of them are PhD students, some are postdocs, and they work closely with their faculty advisors. In many cases, there are decades of research experience working in that field. So these projects are posi positioned at the cutting edge of these individual disciplines. Uh, that's the positive side to the design. Um, coming from the mentors. The negative side is the SIP interns, at least when they start out, they don't have any ownership of the design. But you know what we encourage interns to do is, you know, when you design a project, research projects in particular, open-ended research projects in particular, as students work on them, you tweak the design, you tweak the path um, in response to what you find. And we encourage all SIP interns to get involved in that process. That's the essence of really embedding yourself in the project and gradually 
um, mm -hmm. taking on more of the joint ownership of the project, even though it starts out as a project that's owned by the mentor. At the end of the summer, ideally, it's joint ownership of the project by the interns and the mentor. I don't know I if see. that answers your question. It does. Thank you. Great question. Are there any other questions? Please put your hand up. There are many questions you. in the chat that yeah. I've been frantically typing out and yeah. Shalom has been too. Uh, might be good too while we're, oh, there's a hand up. Jasmine, yeah. please go ahead. Hi, so I had a question about the first two weeks of online research. Mm -hmm. So would that be, um, I think you mentioned like the first week we're learning Python and coding, right? Mm -hmm. So is that gonna be completely asynchronous? No, it's going to be synchronous. Uh, we, we offer um, you know, a total of six hours of mentoring in that workshop. And uh -huh. you're working with mentors, you're writing code during that time. So that's uh, the Python tutorial is roughly six hours in the, yes. in the first uh, week. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a workshop on navigating open-ended research, you know, covering the sorts of topics um, yes. that came up in the last in the response to the last question about ownership of projects and design of projects so we go uh, over a lot of that in week one uh, in addition to that you may be doing background reading that your mentor has given you but some of it is synchronous work some of it is asynchronous yeah okay got it um also are all the projects gonna involve coding and data no. analysis no, no not necessarily uh, most do but not all. Um, they all involve critical thinking of some sort, but mm -hmm. uh, the amount of coding involved varies quite a lot from project to project. There are certain subject areas that are very coding heavy, of course. Uh, all the astro projects are, all the um, you know, computer science, com computation media projects are. So it varies a lot, you know, especially now that SIP is no longer just a science internship program, it's a STEAM internship program. It is uh, very much the case that, um, you know, subject areas like music, history, literature, they involve a different kind of critical thinking, not necessarily coding heavy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, also, uh, yeah. So <clears throat> are you looking for students who have like very focused interests? or students who are more flexible and have a broader interest? We've had students in the past that fit both of the two categories, both of the categories you mentioned. Uh, we occasionally have students who want to work on something very specific. We have something that fits their specific interest and they've been part of the program. Sometimes, you know, having flexibility helps, uh, certainly uh, if, um, you know, if there are many options open and you know many different projects open in a variety of subject areas and a student is flexible um, in terms of their interest, you know, it can work out to their advantage. We definitely want students to work on things that they're genuinely interested in. I, I do want to put that caveat in. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jasmine. All right. Next is NM. NM. Yeah, hi. Uh, so yeah, my first part of the question, I think, is already answered in the chat. I wanted to know if the student has to select to be either a residential or a commuter. They can mix and those. Would choosing... Sorry, sorry. And if I can quickly answer that, they can mix. Yeah. Some weeks they can be in person by taking the shuttle in the morning and back at that every afternoon of the weekday. And some some weeks they can opt to be on campus. Uh, but uh, choosing one or the other would not impact their um, acceptance into the program, right? No, no. That's, uh, you know, generally housing decisions and shuttle decisions are made after acceptance. That's a week by week thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. So I saw, I saw that last year they had, you know, some people came in for all seven days of the week to stay in housing at the SIP program. And yeah. then there was also a five day op like offering if you had someone to go to for the weekend. Are we, yeah. is that, is that structure still being kept or, or is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. So if we don't have family, we'd have to apply for these seven days. 
Yeah, you don't have, I mean, the housing uh, will be available in general for admitted students. So if you don't have um, a, a nearby place to go to, uh, if you don't have local family or uh, local guardians, um, you know, you'll you'll be part we of the seven, seven days. Day yeah, you'll be part of seven day housing. And and again, this is something that can doesn't need to be the same for all seven weeks of housing. If there are certain weekends where you have a place to go to, then uh, you know, again, this has to be done in consultation with your parents and legal guardians, exactly, you know, who we release you to for the weekends. Otherwise, you'll be, you know, um, in seven-day housing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anushree? Yes, Leah, you can mix five-day and seven-day housing depending on which week. Absolutely. Uh, Anushree? Hi. So I had a question. I think there was a similar one in the chat as well. When the research paper gets published, would the interns have their name on it, possibly? Can I take this one, Anna? 100%. Really? Okay. Uh, uh, it varies. It really varies. Um, it depends on two things, Anishu. It's a great question. Um, there are three possible outcomes, right? There's an uh, outcome where this research doesn't get published. That's entirely possible, right? And... Um, because you know that's the nature of open-ended research. You don't know what you're going to find. If what you find is not publication-worthy, it doesn't get published. That's you know I don't want to suggest that every research project at SIB always gets published. It's not that every research project that a mentor's ever worked on, or you know I'm, I'm a mentor myself. It's certainly true that not every research project gets published. Um, the second thing is if it is going to get published, there's a question of time scale. When does it get published exactly? Does it get published right after SIP in the fall, immediately following SIP? Very often not. You know, there is um, what's involved in the publication can involve research that happened before SIP or after SIP. It, you know, it's often a pretty large body of work that gets published. The, what scientists or what academics, not scientists, what academics often think of as a minimum publishable unit can be quite large larger than can be completed during the nine weeks of SIP. Um, so the time scale is also an issue when it happens. And then what actually gets published and whether the intern made meaningful contributions to what actually gets published, that will determine whether um, the, the intern is mentioned at all mentioned in the acknowledgements or listed as a co-author. We've seen all three of these things happen um, where, you know, the, something got published, but it really doesn't have much intersection with the work that was actually carried out during SIP, in which case the interns are not part of the publication. Some cases, the interns have made a minor contribution and they're acknowledged. In some cases, the interns are listed as co-authors. We've had all three of these happen. Does that answer your question, Anisha? Yes, thank you. Thanks. I'm, I'm not going to mispronounce your name, P-I-P-A-T-E. No problem. Uh, my name is Pinky. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, kind of question is, like, what is your selections process for the acceptance? So that's one question. And the second one is, uh, student who's interested in physics. Uh, I know Santa Cruz uh, is a lot in, in marine and bio, so I'm not sure are there is going to be a uh, project for the students who's interested in physics and um, maybe combined with the computers. So if you can share some lights there. No, absolutely. We've had projects in physics every year. We've had projects in astrophysics, which is the division I'm, uh, the department I'm in. Um, Santa Cruz is very well known for its um, astrophysics and high energy physics. Um, there are lots of researchers in these areas. Um, so that the short answer to your question is yes, those subject areas are uh, definitely represented in uh, in SIP. I forgot the first part of your question. Though. The first one was like, how are you select? Uh, your uh, how do we select? Course? And this may be of interest to many people on this call, of course. But um, we are we are looking for interns with this answer may surprise you. We're looking for interns with social maturity. We are looking for. You know, we are working with students who are in a 14 to 17 age group. Um, in the science internship program setting, what happens is there's a lot of independent work. Students have to um, work um, not independently as an individually, but they're working independent of their mentors quite often. 
they're working with fellow high school interns who could be from completely different part of the world, different school. So being able to collaborate, being able to be a team player as well as an individual researcher takes a lot of maturity. Understanding the open-ended na nature of research takes a lot of maturity. We try to listen to the student's voice. That's what we try to do in reading applications. We pay a lot of attention to the student essays. Uh, students are able to write up to two essays on their favorite subject areas and uh, an additional essay that's required on why they're interested in a project like SID. We pay a lot of attention to those um, two or three pieces of writing. I say two or three because a student could write on only one subject area, but they're still required to write about why they are interested in SID. Um, there's also a teacher recommendation that's a free form letter in addition to, um, you know, sort of a form where they're uh, checking boxes. So it's a combination of the two. Um, those are the elements that uh, play the biggest role in um, a student being selected for SIP. And if I can say one more thing about, I think about three things personally when I'm evaluating an application. Is the student likely to advance the research project? Are they, are they likely to push the frontier of knowledge forward by putting up, you know, uh, by putting in this work? That's one question I'm trying to answer. Second question is, how much will the SIP experience benefit the student? How much will they grow as a researcher, as a person, as a human being? I'm looking at that. And you know, the answer to one might be yes, the answer to two may be no, but it's fine if one or both of those boxes are checked. The third thing we're looking for, the third thing I'm looking for, is sort of make sure that what the student expects out of SIP is what we can deliver, right? Because we know what our program does often. Equally, we know what our program doesn't offer. So we're looking for someone who understands the nature of open-ended research and the nature of our SIP program. Does that answer your question? Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Adi? Um, I was just wondering, like, this is kind of like what the previous question was, but what's the biggest, like, differentiator between people who are admitted to SIP and people who aren't? I want to be realistic and say that every summer or every spring when we review applications, it is necessarily the case, based on numbers, that we have to say no to a lot of students who would be wonderful interns in SIP. This is true for any college's admission process, many college's admission process. I would say um, you know, it's true for the UCSC admissions process. It's true for other colleges around the country. Um, so I don't want to pretend that every deserving student is going to get a spot and that so that the numbers don't work out that way. Um, the, the differentiating factors are some of the things I mentioned, but also um, it's sheer luck at some level, because if you've picked a project or if you've picked a subject area that's very heavily oversubscribed, that is there are very few slots available and lots of people have applied for that, you know, then your chance of getting into that are smaller than in if you've picked a subject area that where there are lots of projects and there's not as much, uh, you know, not as heavy a degree of oversubscription. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, so, uh, just to pick up on um, some, someone asked a question in the chat. Um, you know, it's which project, um, two questions. Approximately what was the acceptance rate last year? It was 22% last year. And, um, you know, there are certain project areas where you see very limited numbers of projects. Um, CS tends to get lots of projects, computer science and engineering, computational media, psychology, astronomy, astrophysics, um, applied artificial intelligence. There are lots of projects in these areas. Um, what is hard to tell beforehand is how many, what the oversubscription rate is going to be in those projects, just because we don't know till the applications come in, how many people are applying and, you know, and what their subject area preferences are. Um, but the project areas I just mentioned, the ones with lots of projects, tend to have a reasonable oversubscription rate, not an out outlandishly impossible uh, oversubscription rate. 
some areas like some areas of biology where we have very few projects and a lot of students want to do biology tend to be very oversubscribed. It's a very long answer. Thank you. Shiv? Um, so again, it's sort of similar to a previous question, but um, as far as so for the two weeks of uh, virtual learning, um, like is a lot of that live and sort of on a Zoom call or is it just like set work that we do, like it's set books to read or? It's a combination papers. of the two. Uh, it's a combination of the two. There'll be some fixed time uh, things. We record those. So even those can be accessed asynchronously. But we do have, uh, and the, your mentor may have Zoom meetings with, uh, with the whole team. Um, it tends to be a combination of those two things. Thank you. Thanks. May we intern on multiple projects? No, just one. Okay, thank you. Fiona. Um, I had a few questions more about uh, daily life. So you mentioned that we would be working with other students independent of our mentors. So what would that look like? Like, will we be able to have access to labs like independently without supervision? Like that's generally what I was wondering. Yeah. So generally, if you're doing sort of software related things that are, um, you know, that don't involve physical safety issues, um, you know, some of that may be, um, you know, where, you know, there's sort of broad supervision, but there's not someone looking over the shoulders of the three students who are huddled over your, your laptops trying to do, do some data analysis, for example. Uh, whenever you're in any kind of lab setting with physical safety considerations, it's going to be supervised. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then is there like a lights out or a specific curfew that all the students who live in dorms have to follow? Yes. Yes. Anand, please. Quiet hours start at 10 p.m. and lights out lights out are at 11 p.m. And if your fellow interns in your dorm room, you're okay with having the lights off and just you can continue working or have them dimmed. But generally for the entire dorm hall, uh, 10 is quiet hours and 11 is lights out. Cool. And, 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 and some interns, you know, and roommates, they come to an agreement that, okay, we're going to have our, uh, we, we are going to, go to sleep earlier, we're going to have quiet, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things are going to be quiet for our room earlier. That That's fine, too. Yeah. Okay. Cone, you asked a really good question. What do we do after 4 p.m.? Are we simply allowed to go out and about around the campus or spend time with friends? It's a great question. Cone, how old are you? I am 16. All right. So we're all minors at SIP. Uh, everything has to be done under the supervision of your RAs, PAs, SIP staff, or your mentor. So there are times where there'll be general activities, you'll be in shared spaces. So there will be freedom like that. But typically, you will not just be roaming around campus. If you want to go somewhere, you'll let somebody know. And you can work, you can walk there with a partner or two or within your group of uh, fellow interns. But um, it's not going to be like you're on a college campus and you have free range. Okay. Um, I guess a follow on question would be like, is there is there a library available? Yes, there are okay, multiple libraries available. There's SIP specific areas they can go to and you'll have full range or full use of the library. Okay, thank you. And I would need to let someone know that I'm going to the library like after 4 p.m. or I'm not yeah. just going back to my dorm room. Okay. Generally, there'll be a tracking system in place, but if you're going to go to the library, it's best um, practice to let somebody know whether it's a SIP staff member or, or an RA. Or that makes mentor. sense. Thank you. And what is an RA? Residential mm -hmm. advisor. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Residential assistant? Don't remember which. But they they advise and yes. assist. Lindsay, you had a... It's residential assistant is the official. Yeah. Okay. So there are college students who are trained to supervise housing for other college students, and we employ them over the summer uh, to supervise SIP, yeah. SIP interns. Essentially, they're uh, the staff, the residential staff. So people you can go to. Fiona, do you still, um, is that an old oh, hand? Yeah, or... uh, I just had a, I had one more question. Um, when applying for financial aid, uh, will we have to include additional information like tax forms, like any proof of evidence, or do yes. you just want us to request? No, you yes. upload your uh, tax form. Yeah, you upload something. All right, cool. 
Thank you so much. David? Um, yeah, so for the um, two um, essays about like favorite subjects, is that yeah. subjects regarding that are offered at SAP or is it just any educational subject? You would want to write about the subjects offered, the subject offerings offered. Right, so. Okay, thank you. Carrie? Hi, sorry. Oh, yeah, there you go. Um, what would you say are like the diff like something that's really unique about the program compared to other summer research programs? I want Raja? to take this, please, please, please let me take this. Please. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think what is um I'll give you positives and negatives, uh ways in which SIP is different from other programs. Maybe not all programs. There are certainly other programs that are like SIP. Um, SIP, uh, one of the promises we make is we are going to embed you in an authentic research process. That means you, as a SIP intern, every SIP intern, every group of SIP interns is engaged in an authentic research project, something that's embedded within something bigger. That something bigger is usually a mentor's research project. Um, so we promise immersion in an authentic research process. What we don't promise is a, a finite product or discovery or publication at the end of the summer because a researcher's time is measured in months or years and decades, not weeks. So um, it is impossible for us to guarantee um, something like a discovery or result at the end of the nine weeks of SIP while still maintaining the authenticity of the research that you'll be involved in. I think that aspect of it is both challenging and unique. Well, I, I shouldn't say unique. There are other programs like, like it that makes SIP different from most other high school programs. And I'm very happy to answer the question that PT put. SIP also offers Cosmos uh, program and SIP. What is the exact difference between the two? The duration is fine. Uh, it's, one is four weeks, one is nine weeks. There are other details that are different, but uh, there's a very important difference, and this is very closely related to Carrie's question. When um, in SIP, what happens is the project that the interns are working on are open-ended research projects that the mentors are leading. These are projects that the mentors have not yet worked out. These are research projects that the mentors are in the process of working on. That means you try some things, they don't work, um, and from that quote-unquote failure, you want to learn something and move forward with that, with that new learning. You know, productive failure, we call it, right? Or other people have called it that. Um, this aspect of SIP makes it different from Cosmos. In Cosmos, the students work on projects that mentors have done and completed before, and they, the mentors understand where the twists and turns and pitfalls are, and they can control the degree of navigational help they can give their interns. So they are controlled research projects in Cosmos, and I've been a, an instructor for Cosmos for many years, and in SIP, it's open-ended. Does that help? Yeah, Thank thanks. you. Thanks. I Dao? Pinky yeah. was Pinky was first, I think. Oh, oh. Pinky showed up. Okay. Dao showed up on me. Should I go or should I let someone go? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for holding this session. This has been incredibly informational, so appreciate you guys spending the time on here. Uh, just a quick question on the essays, right? So I'm I'm not clear if there's going to be an essay prompt or are you writing the short essays just to indicate your interest in either a project or a faculty area of it? it there is a very specific essay prompt. There are, um, you know, one essay prompt for each of the two subject areas that the student can choose and a slightly different essay prompt for why SIP. So, sorry, so the, it is a specific essay prompt even for the subject areas. Well, it's a specific, uh, it's a generic prompt in the sense it's not specific to each subject. Um, uh -huh. 
uh, but you know, it, there is a there's a very specific prompt that says, you know, why have you, what interests you about this subject, what got you interested, that kind of thing. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. Thank but, you. But not a different prompt for computers if you chose computer science versus physics, for example. Got it. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Pinky, did you have a question for us? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So the question I had is like how you explain, right? These are the new um, research, right? That PhD students are doing it. Ongoing. So after Ongoing the uh, SIP programs, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure those PhD students are continuing that um, projects or the research. Is this high school students will have that uh, opportunity to continue uh, or extend that projects if they are interested uh, and if the PhD students are interested or on their own to do continuous research on those ones? I'd like to answer this one, please. Uh, I'm just reminding people to post to everyone, not just to me, so that others can answer. Um, uh, Pinky, the answer to your question really varies from project to project. Our mentors are employed by our program and sign, uh, sign up for our program for the duration of the SIP program for those nine weeks. What they do beyond those nine weeks, as you say, sometimes they're doing their research, sometimes they're teaching, sometimes they're taking classes, sometimes they're off traveling, doing field work, attending conferences. We don't have direct control, nor do we want to have direct control over, you know, over the rest of their uh, time in grad school or as a postdoc. So similarly for the high school students, you know, most high school students get extremely busy with schoolwork after SIP ends. If it works out, depending on where the research project is, depending on the degree to which the high school students are engaged, and most importantly, at the mentor's discretion, if it's advantageous to, for all to continue this project. Yes, that does happen, but I can't guarantee that that will happen. Thank you, thank you very much. Pavel, you still have your hand up. Do you ha did you have another question? Oh, no, I didn't, sorry, I'll, I'll lower that now. Okay, no problem. Anushree and then MV and then Eric. <laughs> Hi, uh, so another question. I was curious as to what the weight of your GPA is in your selection process. Practically zero. Got it, okay. No, no, and I, I just wanna justify this. Um, there are students who do very well in their schoolwork and uh, we bring them um, into a project where you're doing things that are very far beyond what you cover in school. And so, we want students who are keen to learn new things, learn on the job, learn new skills, you know, learn a new environment, learn, get new perspective. Um, it's so, the work is very, very far beyond high school classrooms, college classrooms, and even graduate school classrooms. Because of this, we pay very limited attention to GPA. It's like saying, you know, I live in Los Altos, Anand lives in Tracy. Um, if we're both Not planning to go to Japan, it's technically true that I'm closer to Japan than Anand is in Tracy, because I'm slightly west um, in Los Altos compared to Tracy. But the fact is, I'm no closer to Japan than Anand. We both have to go through the airport. There are many, many big hurdles to climb. Um, so yes, one student's GPA could be higher than another student's. They may be better, doing better in high school classes. That is no guarantee that the student with a higher GPA is going to do that much better in SIP. This is this is our justification for it. Got yes, it. I appreciate the analogy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, MP. Oh, hi. Thank you. A uh, very very informative call. Um, so one question I had was so let's say a student expresses interest in a particular subject, let's say physics, um, but the but the research topic they get assigned to may be an area in which they don't know very much. Um, what is typically the process by which a student ramps up? Like once they say, hey, I'm going to take a chance on this. I'm interested in physics, but I don't know anything about this particular thing. Um, what does that ramp up look like before they get started on the research? A couple of different ways. Um, the, typically, this happens through the mentor assigning reading. Uh, the mentor can assign reading that is textbook style, but more often, uh, students are reading papers, 
they are not expected to understand everything they read in a research paper, but they're expected to identify terms and concepts that they don't understand in those papers so that the mentor can go over those things with them. There's a lot of peer learning that goes on. Students are learning as a group. Um, and of course, from the SIP program, you know, through workshops like Introduction to Research, they're learning about the open-ended nature of research. I think your question was about specific content knowledge about physics as an example. That is mostly um, happens within each research group. You know, uh, the, the goal is to teach the interns the skills, tools, and content knowledge they need to succeed in the research project. Thank you. Eric, you've had your hand up patiently for a while. Thank you. Thank you. And just wonder what role DEI is going to play in this admission process. You admit people based on quota from, um, from race, from um, diversity, whatever, <clears throat> those kind of things. You know, you're asking a great question, Eric. Um, we are certainly, as a program, we are looking to make a difference in students' lives. And there are students who apply to our program who have access to many, many, many uh, opportunities by virtue of, uh, you know, sometimes by, by being in well-resourced schools. Um, and sometimes students are applying to us from you know, from environments where they have very limited access to these things. We are, it's a balancing act for us. We are trying to, we are trying to make a big difference in students' lives. Like I said before, we are trying to make sure students are advancing the research project, but they're not, uh, uh, and that's one of the uh, things we're looking for. We're also looking to see if we can make a big difference in the student's life. And um, we are also very interested in like, Expectation management, students who are coming in with a clear knowledge of what SIP offers and doesn't offer. And of course, as a program, we are trying to impact the whole world. We are trying to uh, bring students into our program, give this experience to um, as many communities of students as possible within our limited means, within our limited means of number of slots we have every summer, uh, amount of finances we have every summer. I don't know if that answers your question, Eric, but that's a it's a great question. It's a tricky question. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. You answered my question. Um, Cohen and then Jasmine. Oh, and then um, I saw that across 2023, 2022, and 2021 that there were there was at least two projects that were repeated. Like, is it reasonable to assume that projects will be repeated across multiple years. Like if I see a project from 2023, I can see it again, possibly in 2024 and ask to be placed on that project. Um, it depends on whether the mentor is available for one thing. And, you know, research is always evolving. So it's not identical from year to year. Even if the description looks identical, the work that's going on in detail is invariably different because this project is always about, um, SIP is always about doing new things. I mean, uh, the mentors research wouldn't be very successful if they were just repeating the same thing. Okay, Cohen, thank maybe you. If you're, if you're interested in a specific project that has been done in the past, maybe write about why you're interested in what that project was, was made up of, and that'll be a good way to, if that project is available, then we'll be able to see that you're interested in that, and that would play a factor in matching you to that project. Okay, because we write an essay, right? So that would be the place yeah. where I talk about that. In your exactly. subject area essay, talk about yeah. why that project spoke to you. That. And I'm sorry, I'm sure you mentioned this in the slides, but there are three essays. There's one as a subject area, I think you said, and then what, what were the other two? subject area essays, your top subject two and your second short subject. short subject area essays. Mm -hmm. These are 250 words or less, and then one longer personal statement about why you are interested and what you want to get out of SIP. This is 450 words or less. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Roger, do you want to call on the next Yeah, speaker? sure. Jasmine, I am I know we're out of time, so I want to be... Also, thank you for staying on. Uh, this will be posted to the YouTube channel, so if you do have to get back to whatever you were doing, you can 
um, watch this on your own time. But we appreciate everyone that came and gave us an hour and learned more about SIP. Jeff. Sorry about that. Thank you guys for staying on longer. Um, I had a question about the research projects. So when will the individual projects be posted and will all of them be posted before our applications do? No, short answer, no. So mentors have a longer time frame to submit their projects just because their research is evolving. Um, so we will post projects as we receive them and as they've been approved and everything is good to go. So you can expect by March 1st, there will be about 20 projects. Um, but again, we ask you to look at previous year's projects and apply it towards a subject area in your application. Okay, thank you. Thanks. AK? Hi, uh, my question is, uh, do you accept homeschoolers? Yes, we do. Absolutely. Yeah, we have. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Eric? Yeah, thank you for taking another question from me. So will the decisions be made by uh, those PhD students who have research project so they pick the student or it's by just a, a committee that is made up maybe some professor have nothing to do with those advisors it's a combination our many mentors sign up to read applications um, the, we have a team of readers we have a lot of applications last year we had over 2,000 completed applications so it's a team effort to read essays and then the actual placement just depends on more than how highly a particular application was rated. It also depends on availability of slots in the subject areas and things like that. It depends on, you know, a person who's, um, um, yeah, committed to, uh, you know, being here for, yeah. I mean, we are expecting students to do this project in person. Sometimes students will ask us if, um, you know, if they can do part of it online, we give priority to students who can do this in person. So there are multiple factors that go into this. Thank you. Thanks. I need to run off, um, everyone, for another meeting. So I'll thank you all for being here. This is a, a really big group we had today, you know, close to 100 yeah. people, including our um, our our SIP team and our Quest team. Um, we are nine so... days away from the application opening. We encourage you all to apply. And we will be having another information session next week, along uh, with application workshops throughout the month of March. So there will be plenty more opportunities for you to ask questions directly to us. And if you do have questions, please email us, ucsc-sip at ucsc.edu. And we'll put that in the chat. But thank you, Raja. I can and continue. Anand Lily, I didn't mean to cut you off, yeah. but I, I just need to step away. Sorry. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. AK? I'm uh, sorry, I probably forgot to lower my hand, sorry. No worries, okay. GV? Uh, yeah, hi, thank you so much for the valuable information session, by the way. Uh, two questions. First one is, is there like a rolling uh, decision process that you guys do? In other words, is there a difference between applying uh, early on March 5th versus March 29th? No. Okay. A application review process starts after. So okay. that, that will take place in April, but there are mm -hmm. rounds of admission. So the first round of admissions go out on uh, April 26th and there will be following rounds leading up to May 7th. Okay, sounds good. Uh, second question is, do you guys, for the research, do you guys have the um, SIP students uh, sign some sort of an NDA? Um, like uh, any, is in other words, anything secretive in terms of a research going on that they can't include about it in their college admission application? That depends on the specific project. If an NDA is required, your mentor will okay. reach out to you and that'll be, that'll be done beforehand. Most of the time, there is no NDA required and you can write about your project and research project experience within in your SIP app, in your right. college application. But right. even if you can't specifically state what you did, you can still talk about participation in SIP and what you gained from your research. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Leah? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for hosting this session again. Um, Absolutely. I was just wondering if the informational session like next week will be any different from this one. So the first half, the presentation will be the same. 
the second half Q and A. That's the Wild West. It'd be probably a different question. So, um, if you can attend live, it'll be from six to seven p.m. Pacific time. And if not, then it'll be posted on the YouTube channel. You can just kind of skim through. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yemen. Um. So, do you um have a more um California student than the non California student in the SIP program? Do you give a priorities and what's a typical percentage um location is not a priority or something that's taken um into consideration when in the review process just typically it, we tend to have more california students just because we are based in santa cruz and in a in person year it's easier for california residents to be able to come to sit um so it just kind of depends uh but last year a really fun fact we had 400 students and 25%, 99 of them were international students. So we really had a more world or outside of California, more international audience last year. Thank you. Thank you. Eric? Yeah, for the recommendation letter, does it have to be a, like a formal recommendation letter or just a bunch of questions the recommender just need to respond, like yes or no? It should be a formal letter of recommendation. Thank you. Yeah. Fiona, one question or two questions or three? Just one, just one. <laughs> okay. I'm not doing this strictly last time. Okay. Um, my last question was, um, I saw that next month there will be application workshops. Yeah. So I was just wondering, are those like to actually help with applications or are you just answering general questions? So in the first application session, we'll run through the application. We'll fill it out with you. And then if you need specific help, we can go into breakout sessions and there's SIP staff so we can help you one-on-one. -on -one. And if that doesn't, if that's not necessary, then we'll just have Q and A and there'll be more projects and there'll be updated information so we can continue just the open Q and A. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, it is 16 minutes after. Are there any additional questions? Now would be a great time to ask them, and if not, then we will call it a session. Uh, hi, I have one question uh, mm -hmm. for this session. Um, what will be the timings uh, for the student to attain the program? Like I heard like it's like uh, seven week residential or seven week in person can yeah. be possible from the Bay Area. What will be the timings? Ash, I'm not sure if you cut out in the middle of your question, but what I heard are like, what are the times or what are the dates of the seven weeks? Uh, what is the timings from morning to evening? Uh, I am okay. concerned is it is commute possible from the Bay Area? 100% commute is possible. The research week and day is from Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So generally we want all our interns to arrive by the bus, the shuttle will bring them and they will be dropped off before nine. The first session of researchers from nine to 12, there is a one hour lunch break from 12 to one. And then the second afternoon session is from one to four and the bus will take them back. Um, there's a variety of commute options. There is a North shuttle and South shuttle. This will pick them up from the North. If this is the North shuttle with Silicon Valley shuttle, that's a weekly Monday through Friday and once a week, Monday mornings and afternoon, uh, Friday afternoon drop off. But yeah, I hope that kind of answers oh, your question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Shri? I'm so sorry to ask you this redundant question. I'm so no sorry. I, I stepped out for a few minutes. <laughs> you know, no we're all, all in the middle of work. Um, yeah. I know that somebody addressed this whole publication and the college admissions and NDA and everything. Um, so one quick question I had is, um, there was somebody had asked this question and I was looking for answer in the chat is, do they, are they like considered as in this whole research, if there was something that they did substantially, are they included in the publish when they published or no? Because it's such a short seven week, but I was it just curious short... about that. So that's really the relationship and the progress that is made between the mentors and the interns. If it is substantial progress, then they will more likely than not be included. But again, that is not guaranteed. That's not something we can guarantee. That's just based off the progress and the work the interns do alongside their mentor. So if they do a good job, there is a high likelihood. But again, 
It just, okay. it could be whether they're closer to being publishable or if they're in the very beginnings of their research. Sounds good. Then they have Sounds good. Thank you. So, sorry if, if, I, if no it worries. was a redundant question all over again. Sorry. Thank That's you. That was a good question. No worries. All right. Any last outstanding questions? Uh, can I ask you, so at the end of um, <clears throat> the research project, uh, there will be some writing up, right? Like uh, um, several pages uh, of paper for the student to present, right? At the end. Not necessarily. So SIP final presentation day, this is all projects will, and the interns will have a 15 minute time slot and they will present in a presentation format the research they did. Not to say that some projects will write a research paper, will have writing parts to it, but the end product that SIP that we we expect from all SIP interns and they will present is a 15 minute presentation. So that's the Thank deliverable. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. With that, we will call it for the third. SIP 2024 information session. Thank you all for being here. I'll stop the recording.